A vintage car is rear-ended and explodes in flames. It just made a big ball of fire. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. The driver is trapped behind the wheel. It just exploded and the flames came up and I knew he was in trouble. A peaceful August Sunday in Sherman Oaks, California. At 9.30 a.m., Steve Sotelo, a professional chauffeur, is on his way to work. At the corner of Burbank Boulevard and Vesper Avenue, he notices a beauty stopped at the light ahead of him. A 1932 Ford Victoria, like this one. Whoever owned that car put a lot of money into it because it looked really nice. He pulls up to take a closer look, just as a car races past him in the other lane. The car that was next to me was just not slowing down and hit the back of his car without braking and hit it really hard and just exploded and caused a big ball of fire. Amazingly, the occupants of the car that rear-ended the vintage Ford are only slightly injured. But the driver of the antique car is out cold and trapped in flames. I figured he was going to probably be unconscious or, or hurt pretty badly, so I immediately parked and got off and ran, ran towards his car. The force of the crash has pushed the burning car all the way through the intersection. When Steve reaches the car, he realizes the situation is worse than he thought. I think upon impact, his seat reclined back. I immediately tried to open the door from the outside. Uh, it didn't budge. I was trying to open, open it from the inside. It didn't, it didn't open. In his apartment near the intersection, Patrick Murray has heard an explosion. I had immediately come over to the balcony where I saw a lot of black smoke. smoke. I saw the vehicle on fire. My next instinct was to grab a camera and videotape it. At the same time, Chris Oxley is heading toward the intersection with his son in the car on the way to a baseball game. We saw a big fire ball in front of us and then smoke rising from the fireball. We had a mushroom cloud on top of that probably went two to three stories up. The whole road was on fire. My son was terrified about it because he, he was asking me, Dad, do we have to go towards this? This is scaring me. But he hears Steve shouting for help. So Chris stops the car and jumps out, telling his son to stay in the car. Somebody's life, you know, was probably in danger. I thought it was going to blow up, so I was thinking get him out and get him as far away from the car as, as we could. The inside of the car was starting now to catch on fire, and we had troubles pulling the person out of the car. As they struggle, other Good Samaritans appear. Somebody with an, with an extinguisher, a fire extinguisher, came and sprayed a little bit on the inside. But the heat is intense. I could feel the heat all the way from here, and obviously it's, you know, I'm across the street. And they still can't open the door. There was uh, someone else who came up who, um, he said, well, let's try to get him out the back window. And he had some type of crowbar or something and then broke out the back window. Finally, Chris can reach in and open the jammed front door. But the fire inside the car is getting closer to the trapped driver and to them. I was scared, to be honest with you, thinking it was going to blow up. My initial thought was that this guy's not going to make it. What's pinning the driver in the car? Chris and another good Samaritan fumble around in the smoke. I found a seatbelt. And the problem was, was, it was like an airplane style seatbelt since it was such an old car. I just found it on the feel, feeling with my fingers and, and feeling underneath the bottom of the seat until I, I hit what I felt was a seatbelt. And then we pulled him away from the car, laid him down on the ground, I braced his neck. I thought I was videotaping somebody's last moments of life. I don't know how someone could survive that type of accident. But then, a miracle. The driver is breathing. I could see his chest going up and down the stomach. So I'm like, okay, thank God he's breathing. So uh, we're really happy to see him open his eyes. And uh, one of his first questions was, <laughs> how's my car? At that time, he couldn't see his car. But I was telling him, you don't worry about your car, uh, you're alive. The car is almost completely consumed, except for the seat where the driver had been trapped. The only part of that car that wasn't uh, burning or didn't get burnt was that driver's side uh, door. That, that was it. To the rescuers, it had seemed an eternity, but in reality, only two minutes had passed. The fire department probably got there probably within a couple minutes after we actually had them out, and they came and put the fire out of the car. The paramedic put him on a gurney and 
lifting him up and uh, he told me thank you. I remember that when I told him you're going to be okay and he said yes, thank you and uh, I, uh, I basically left after that. The Good Samaritans, their job done, melt away. Were it not for Patrick Murray's video, they might never have been identified. The police officer asked if he could use the video footage to help, you know, find the rescuers. Four of the five men, including David Taylor and Fernando Martinez, have now been identified as the heroes who helped save the life of Robert Edlifson. He will recover completely. The car, unfortunately, was a total loss. Despite the risks they took, both Sotelo and Oxley say they'd do it again. I just don't know, you know, how close I was to death. It affected someone else's life. I mean, that's, that made it all worth it, right?